All right. Thank you so much. Well, it's an honor to be here. Um, how many have never been, uh, have never met me or seen me before? Anybody here? All right. So there's at least, at least half the people I haven't offended yet. That's great. Uh, no. Um, no, it's really an honor to meet you. You know, the life of a church, um, you know, it's different than, than other organizations. You know, it, it changes all the time. And, um, and so sometimes when, when uh, we're talking about things, some people go, oh, yeah, I remember that. And others are going like, what's he talking about? And really, um, this is a family. And families do grow and change. Um, I have a, a son-in-law. He's Korean-Taiwanese. And when he started in our family, he, we had our Christmas. And he says, well, that was a white Christmas. Uh, he didn't mean the snow. It meant no rice. You know what I'm saying? So it, like, it was like suddenly our family was a huge shift. So the next year we had hot pot for Christmas Eve. You know what I'm saying? See, families change. And those, those changes are good. But sometimes changes are hard. Um, there's uh, loss or there's uh, division. And, um, and so a family has to be... Uh, has to recognize that this is a culture. What We set the tone for everything here. And I want to talk about that today. Because right now, the world has lost um, the places to agree to disagree. You know, conflicts are so weird. You know, just one word or one name, which we'll leave unnamed at this time. <laughs> That starts with a T. No, I'm kidding. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I, you know that, you know, what's that, what that's so, da, na, 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 you could guess the word, but you know it. But these divisions are real because, you know, I'll have people come to me and say, um, you know, uh, I've lost communication with my son because of my political affiliation, or there's just all kinds of stuff out there. And uh, um, I'll be meeting with church boards, and, and even on the board, they'll have um, people, uh, children that are looking for their identity, uh, their sexual identity and gender and things. And I'm, today, it's just where there's a landmine wherever we turn, right? But the truth is, is that um, we're mature. Maybe I should say, it's a question mark. Are we mature? No. You know, we, we have to really challenge our thinking and our freedoms right now. Can I invite you right now to, to lose some of your freedoms to Jesus? I'm not saying you lose your freedom. You give your freedom. You see, Jesus, um, he took the form of a servant. Not accounting equality with God, something to be grasped. And um, I have made a decision that I want to be the safest person in the world. I want to be a person that loves people that are so differently from me. I want to be the kind of person that is unoffendable. I... Uh, one time I went down to a hot tub at a hotel and got in the hot tub and the guy looks at me and says, what do you do? And I says, well, I always try to, you know, cloak that I'm a pastor or a missionary. I said, well, I, you know, I am a public speaker on, you know, coming into your destiny. He goes, are you a Christian? You know, all right, I didn't do very good on that one. I'll have to work on my, uh, my hiding there. And I said, yes. And he goes, well, I'm a Satanist. And he was just looking for that response, right? And I said, that's amazing, because when I looked at you, the Lord said to me, you want to be a good father, because you didn't have a good father. And he looks at me and goes, are you a wizard? <laughs> no, I'm here to give you the love of the Father. I'm so glad I met you in the hot tub, because you think, you think, you think Lucifer is awesome? Wait till you meet Jesus. <laughs> he created him. I was praying over a woman or a man. I didn't know. 
I said, Lord, is that a man or a woman? He says, what do you care? <sighs> I love that person. She came to Jesus, the guy with her came to Jesus. We referred her down the street to a prayer house. Did you know that you can measure your freedom by your level of offendability? You can measure your freedom by how much your opinion has to be more important. Okay, good. Amen. I have an anointing of freedom. I have a sword. How about if I just release it right now? You can just start feeling it. I just command the sword throughout this room. Things you've been battling in your mind, judgments of people you've been holding, weariness that's in your spirit that you didn't even know. You were still defending something that was already resolved. <laughs> I just command that sword to come today. I command a new level of freedom for this place. Lord, for Coast Christian, this would be the house of freedom. That doesn't mean we put up with everything. It means we love everyone. And we call people into truth. But we love them into truth. We call them into wholeness. In Jesus' name. Do you have tablets, Bibles, iPads, phones? Does anybody have a, like a physical Bible? Let me see you. That's awesome. I, you know, I was thinking the other day, I, want, I, I wonder where that is. You know, I'm like, I, I have an iPad that I, I have... Uh, um, you know, in a phone and, and uh, keep notes. I actually journal quite a bit to hear the Lord. I do it on the computer. And, but I was sitting there, I think it was yesterday, I was going, I just want to go home. When I fly home, and I go in and grab my Bible and feel that leather and, and enjoy it. But you know what? If you got your Bible there, I want to read in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And if you don't mind, I'm going to rent from the NIV. And it's my, one of my best friends is Brian Simmons. Anybody know him or have heard of him, the Passion Translation? And uh, we do tours together to Israel. We, uh, we go to Cabo together. We take, if you want to go on Alaska cruise, it's not too late. We're going August 3rd, Brian and I and Candace and Ann. So uh, just go to passionandfire.com forward slash uh, cruise and we'll take you. Okay. And by the way, my website's, everybody's got to get that plug in, right? While you're turning to your page. No, you're... Uh, TOTN.org. It's very easy. Okay, you can learn about our work in Kenya and what we're doing. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we have a passage on glory. Or though it seems, right? It seems like it's all about glory. And it is. And what happens in this text, there's a there's really a description of the glory that we have compared to what Moses had what the Old Testament glory was like versus the New Testament glory. And the reality is this, is that we all want more glory. How, much want, how, much, how, how many want more glory? Okay. Who here is against glory? Let me see your hands. Okay. <laughs> of course, we all want glory. And what do we mean by that? Okay. Now, there's, a lot of, there's different words in the Old Testament, New Testament for glory, but in essence, the glory is the manifest presence of God. It can come in various forms. Sometimes we feel the weight, Shabbat glory, there's other kinds of glory, radiant glory, the light glory, like on Mount of Transfiguration. I have a sermon. People hate it when I say this. I have a sermon called The Five Levels of Glory, which I'm not going to do today. So you're going to, oh no, what are the five levels? Well, you can go to the YouTube or whatever and on TOTN.org, you can actually down look at my, some of my sermons. So that's there. But what I want to talk about here is that if you're going to come into a new level of glory, it's going to take a mind shift. Okay. First of all, I can just test it right away. How many of you have a greater glory than Moses? Okay, it tells me your head has not been shifted. How many of you have the same glory that Jesus had? Your heads aren't shifted yet. You want to have a head shift? Did you know that the greatest challenge I want to give you is try to study every verse that's really hard for you to believe about you and just meditate on them every day? Like, therefore, there's no, con you know, in Christ, if you're in Christ, there's no condemnation. I'm a no condemn condemnation zone. So the Bible says this, the glory that came on Moses was on the outside. 
okay? When he put his head into the cleft of the rock and the glory passed by, the glory of God was so great that it really, like the moon, reflects the light of the sun, not having any light of itself. But what happened is that light was so amazing, it actually, that glory rested on Moses. But guess what? It started fading from that day. And so when the people saw him, is it okay if I'm just paraphrasing the text? I just want to base, base this is in the Bible. Okay, I'll come to a few of the verses. So when they saw him and he was fading, you know, he started to fade a little bit. First they saw him and go, oh, look, you know, he, he's glowing. How many would freak out if you came out of your prayer closet and looked, you were, you know, you're, so you met someone just glowing, right? That's what he looked like. And so they could see the glory on him, which gave him credibility in their minds to make the declarations. Okay? But as it started to fade, guess what? He got insecure and he put a veil over his head. It's kind of like, oh, I don't want to draw any attention to my glory on my face. By the way, for those of you that know me, that's fading. He was hiding the fact that it was fading. And this is what the Bible says. It says that if, if, if you look with me here, I, I'm, I'll just, because it, it kind of goes into a loop, but I want you to see, he, it compares that glory to the glory you, you have, okay? And it says this. Let, let me look at verse, um, uh, verse 8 here. It says, how much more radiant is this new and glorious ministry of the Spirit that shines from us? Am I reading from the t- Passion Translation, aren't I? Because that's my phone is on. For if the former ministry of condemnation was ushered in with a measure of glory, how much more does the ministry that imparts righteousness far excel in glory? What was once glorious no longer his any, holds any glory because of the increasingly greater glory that has replaced it. What is this glory that's replaced it? The ministry of the Spirit. What's the difference? The glory is that Moses had it come upon him. You, everyone in this room, when you accepted Christ, the Holy Spirit came into you and upon you. Guess what? Now the glory's here. And you can grow. That's what verse, if you go all the way to verse 18, it says you can go from glory to glory. Meaning yours is increasing, his was fading. So the Bible's teaching you, the Bible's teaching you, not, not, not Papa Mark, not dude from Portland, Oregon. The Bible's teaching you that you have a greater glory than Moses. It's not saying you're greater than Moses. It's saying that you have a glory in you that's increasing compared to a glory that was on him on the outside that faded. It doesn't mean that what he had wasn't amazing. For its time, it was amazing. But, and it, you know, we know that, it, that the Holy Spirit came upon all flesh on the day of Pentecost. That was the whole thing. Jesus said, it's better for you that I go because I'm going to send my Holy Spirit and he's going to come upon you with power. Amen? So, so there was a shift. So right now, today is time for your shift. Get over it. Your greater glory than Moses. Decide it. Shift in your head to say, this isn't my choice. This isn't, I, I'm not looking in the mirror and saying, oh, look how great I am. I was, I'm, I'm a son, I'm a daughter, adopted, and I have the Holy Spirit within me, and the greater, the glory that's in me is the ministry of the Spirit, and it's increasing, and I'm so excited because I have a greater glory than they ever knew. Or Moses or his people. How many of you have a greater glory than Moses? If you didn't raise your hand, this, is this work going okay? Look. If you didn't raise your hand, it's okay. We have an a inner healing team. To, uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. You, know. you can disagree with me. I, I disagree with me all the time. Um, so that's a shift. Now, now I'm not going to go there, but you know, if you look at John 17, when Jesus is praying for believers to come, he says, Father, I have given them the same glory you gave to me. Did you hear that? How about another brain shift? I know you're still catching up with the Moses one. (laughs) 
Father, I want to see myself as an adopted son or daughter with the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the Spirit. Again, are we saying we're greater than Jesus? Absolutely not in any way, shape, or form. Jesus said it, I have given them the same glory you gave to me. Meaning, on earth, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I have authority on earth to release the glory of God. How many are following that? This is really, really important. This has to be a shift in you. Now, here's a little bit of my story for those of you just meeting me. I was a Baptist pastor for 10 years. I love my Baptist heritage. I led many people to Christ. I mean, I did, I did the five spiritual laws, you know, with pine cones, okay? I did it, in the sun, I did it at the beach. I, I, I led so many people to Christ. I had such a, such a passion for, for people to come to Christ. I also um, did missions, and I had a heart for missions from, from early on. But one of the things that I didn't know how to do is I didn't know how to move in this ministry of the Spirit, I'd never seen a cancer healed. I'd never seen, um, uh, I, I'd never seen deliverance. I'd never seen the kind of healing that could happen until a woman came from, to me in my church and asked me to pray for her cancer. And I knew suddenly that I was naked and poor. By the way, I had a growing church, double services, big property, everything going like you're supposed to on paper, multiple choirs and children's and, you know, all, everything that, that our church was said you're supposed to have, have. And then when I looked and I looked at that woman, I thought, I've never seen a cancer healed. I all of a sudden felt like, wow, I'm powerless. And it started a journey, and I don't have time for it, but I did become a Baptocostal. <laughs> Worse than that, I freaked out the charismatics. Because I went to Kenya, and the people came from, literally, would walk hours, and they wanted me to pray for their deaf baby's ears. I was scared. I was scared than them. Pray for my deaf baby. I'm going, oh, no. What happens if the baby doesn't get healed? I was freaking. All of a sudden, you have the ministry of the Spirit. Ears open. And it wasn't enough for me. I took people like you, and I still do this. My favorite thing is to throw you into a village for six hours. I'll come back and get you. I promise I will. Will I do this, Andrea? Yes, I will. Why? Because I think you're really anointed. And the power on you is amazing. Because you can do the things that Jesus did. Okay, here's another one of those verses that's hard to believe. Anyone who believes in me will do the things I've been doing. Even greater things will he do. Who is doing greater things than Jesus? Let me see your hand. Wow, this is an amazing church. I want that. I've been to, more, I've been to a lot more nations than Jesus has. I've been to 40. He only, do you know what Jesus chose to do? He chose to limit himself. Three years. I've been in ministry 30. He chose a people group. I've gone to 40. Does it make me greater? Absolutely not. The work of the cross is the greatest work ever done. It will always be. It is the core of our, of our faith. It's the foundation of our faith. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying that behind me, when I go to Russia or Kenya or Philippines. I want to have the wind behind me to know that when I come, I'm bringing the glory of God and I'm going to bring a shift to that region or nation. And if I don't believe it, I just show up and go, oh, you're a little old me. I hope something happens. But today I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about you and the mind shift. When you walk out of here, Wow. One time I was in India, and I was in the darkest place I've ever been in the world. It's called Varanasi. 
the Ganges River is there. It's where when uh, people from India die, the, those that can afford it send their bodies. The bodies are burned and put into the water to, for them to have uh, salvation or a higher level of reincarnation. There's a, there's a temple there for Lord, Lord Shiva, one of the, their trinity. They have millions of gods, but they do have an upper trinity. And I was going up toward that, um, toward that temple. And all of a sudden, I just, the demonic on me was like unheard of. I started to lose breath. I, could, I was really weak. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm quoting, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I was getting worse and worse. I said, Lord, what's going on? He said, oh, he said, um, if you knew what you look like to the literally thousands and thousands of demons, they're all cursing you right now. I said, well, show me, Lord. All of a sudden, I saw this glory. I couldn't believe it. And I saw a man in the middle of it. And I said, Jesus, is that you? And he goes, no, that's you. He said, you carry my glory, son. They don't oppose you. They carry, you carry my presence. You're an ark. I chose to live in you. I chose to make my home in you. Just as my word says, John 14 through 16, that I... The whole revelation, I will make my home in you. If you love me, I will reveal. The son, the son says, the Father and I will reveal ourselves to you. There needs to be a shift, people. And let me show you how this continues in this text. You're going to get exactly why, why I talked about freedom. Because, see, there's all this talk about glory Starting, at, like I said, verse 7 goes all the way down to verse 13. We're not like Moses, who used to hide the glory to keep the Israelites from staring at him and as it faded away. See, their minds were hardened, closed, and hardened for even to this day. That veil has overcome their minds when they hear the words of the former covenant. That veil has not yet been lifted from them. It's only eliminated when one is joined to the Messiah. How many of you have been joined to the Messiah? See, it was lifted. So until now, whenever the Old Testament is being read, the same binding comes over their hearts, blinding. But the moment one turns to the Lord with an open heart, the veil is lifted and they see. Now here's the, the verse that everybody's heard. Now the Spirit I'm referring to is the Holy Spirit, and wherever He is Lord, there is freedom. I started really, this, I'm writing a book on this called Freedom Glory. I'll come out with it soon. Uh, I'm thinking, what is this verse on freedom doing smack in the middle of a whole text on glory? He's talked about glory, 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 glory. And all of a sudden, it says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. How do you measure if you're free? I started the sermon with that. You're not offendable. You're not even offended by yourself. You're not wounded by yourself. A lot, do you know I meet a lot of people today in their healing? They're wounding themselves every day with their own thoughts. They live under a cloud of judgment. And they are the judger. Or they live under someone else's cloud. They still can't get past the, the words their father said or their mother said or their past employer said or the one teacher said or maybe what some demon said. See, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Where is the Spirit of the Lord, first of all? In you. I've spent... 
probably the last 20 years pretty much on the topic of freedom. It's one of my two major swords that I carry. I found that in my own mind and heart, I had a battle raging. My greatest captor was me. I live uh, in a lot of freedom. Try to make me feel guilty. It'll never work. I repent. I love repentance. In fact, I can't, I can't believe it. I got a text from my wife out of the blue this morning and said, I love your heart for repentance. But guess what? Repentance isn't what most people think it is because they're still judging it through Old Testament covenant. I don't repent because I feel guilty. I get repent because I get convicted. Because I could feel guilty anytime for anything. Isn't it true? I cut someone off in the freeway. All right, they cut me off, and I'm even more offendable. I mean, I'm kidding. See, your inner life is really a measurement. And um, I really encourage you, you know, Romans 8, uh, when it says that the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. How do you know if, you're, if your mind is controlled by the Spirit? You have life and peace. <laughs> and so I started really meditating on this, and, and guess what? The, 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 the next verse is where the King James talks about going from glory to glory. There's this connection. It says here, we can all draw close to him and the veil removed from our faces. And with no veil, we all become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of Lord Jesus. The veil's gone and we're, f we're focused on Jesus. That's why we worship. That's why we take you know, 40, at least 40%, up to 50%, some churches 30, whatever. But, but why we have worship, it's a time where you're focusing on him and his glory. You're not focusing on you and your problems and what, what, what you know, your thought life and all those. You're just focusing on him. And then as you're doing that, that's why we're told to turn our eyes upon Jesus. As you're doing that, you're being transformed into his likeness. There's, a, there's actually a shift in you that's happening. You know, I'm, um, I, I uh, publicly share, I'm not very good at traditional worship. Because I'm not really, I never play music in my car. I never play music at home. I'm not musical. I live with an amazing prophetic worshiper who works, does music all the time. Um, I'm not sure why. I used, to, I used to think I was broken. And I really want to challenge you if, you, uh, if you're of the about 20% who find it hard to connect through, worship, through music. Um, it doesn't mean you're a bad worshiper. It just means you need to learn how to worship. So where's the mom that was with her little girl over here today? In the nursery now? That was amazing worship over there. Or Kate, where's Kate? Is she here? Is she in the nursery too? Okay. Hi, Kate. Just because I, you know, spiritual daughter, Andrea, love her so much, and my son, Joe, but the purity of your heart. You could just feel it in your worship. Thank you to the whole worship team, but I was having a proud spiritual grandpa moment. But that's what turned me. So what I'm trying to share with you is that, is that don't worry if you're different, but learn how to focus on Jesus. Because we're not trying to focus on music. Music helps most of us. But where our goal isn't in that. Our goal is to be in his presence. Our goal is to love him and to become more like him. And I love corporate worship because the culture and the context, I just start getting words of knowledge and, you know, I just have fun. Started today with, with Anthony. Anthony's uh, on a journey of education right now. He's getting trained. 
Fund, the Lord gave me the word this morning, fundamental. I thought that was interesting. And then he played, played with the word fun, fundamental. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's all right, you know. Of course, I joke around all the time, like, you demand, so. But uh, I feel like this is a real time of renewing of your mind and really understanding what it means to do that, but having fun doing it and creating even new techniques. You're gonna, I believe you're going to write a book and you're going to show how to reach this generation. You're going to use new language. You see, as we come into his likeness, it says we go from glory to glory. I'm going to ask you a direct question. What would that look like for you? You see, we're all at different places. And the journey isn't like a straight one. It's like when we're going on a mountain climb or a trail, we don't always know what's around the corner. I know that uh, my son has a real heart for the things that I do, so I know he talks about coming into your destiny and coming into your purpose and knowing your calling and knowing your sonship and all those things. For some of you, coming into a greater glory is just believing, just really coming to the the realization that you're worthy of that love. For some of you, it's, um, it's been hard to make the, tra the, the transition from the kingdom to your business or your work life. I've been preaching a lot on the prophetic in the marketplace because I love prophesying in the marketplace. I love it. That's why I'm a loan officer. I am. I want to be in homes. I want to be with people that don't know the Lord. And, I can, and then I want to prophesy over their loan. I'm serious. I want to have strategy from heaven on how to improve credit and do all kinds of things. I mean, it's, it's fun for me to, to, to know that uh, prophecy isn't just for uh, ministry as we define it. Prophecy, I can ask the Lord about anything. And I do. But what I want to say is that I'm going to challenge you today. I'm really trying to love you in, in a way that will challenge you, though, is that, is that there's the shift that has to take place to say, God wants me to give me more expressions of his glory, and the only thing holding me back is my level of freedom. The freedom is the context. The freedom is... Uh, is the culture. Mind if I tell a story on you? <laughs> Joe had traveled with me, I think, to both Mexico and Kenya, and I think you've gone to the Philippines, right? It's true, will I drop you off in a village? We're going to go next year. Philippines, we're going to the Philippines in September, and I'll tell you, if you love Jesus, you love the Philippines, and you love massage, it's a trip for you. Okay? Uh, massage is a part of their culture. Everybody gets it. And it's cheap and good. So we do it all together. It's fun, you know. Eight people in our basic area. I don't know where that came from. I guess my freedom kind of took over there for a second. <laughs> I have led so many moosooses to Christ. It's amazing. So uh, I always ask the Lord if I can wait till the end, but he always wants to do it in the middle. Oh, yeah. But anyways, Andrea went with me to Mexico. And... Um, Somehow she was just informing me that she never would get up in front, had never talked in the microphone, right? For how many years? Long, long time. And um, I think she was kind of sizing me up like what my expectations were going to be. Was that pretty much what you were doing? Okay. Because usually in our trips I try to, you know, it's like an eagle's nest. I like to lovingly you out of the nest, you know, and see if you can fly, you know, and send you with a few people. And But God always sends a few on the trip, and you know that the last thing they need is pressure. See, I'm starting to talk about a culture of freedom. I'm shifting right now. The culture of freedom is that when you start to be free individually, and it starts becoming a high value of your culture, 
all religious pressure goes away. We don't fast because we have to. We, we fast because we want to, right? I had people in my church that wanted, we were fasting, I'm not sure, and I don't really feel led. And I said, good, go, ahead, go eat really good hamburgers and pizzas and tell us about it next week, you know? I don't want anybody in our church fasting because they think they should, okay? I want people who feel called to fast. Stuff like that. In a freedom, in a culture of freedom, it's like we're taking away false expectations for you to be like us. We want you to be like you. We don't want to have hoops you have to jump through. We want you to know Jesus better. We want you to be intimate with him, and we want to create a culture where you know how to receive the conviction and the love of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. But the last thing we want to do is create an environment where you feel less than because you don't do something others do. Now, sometimes we can't help it. You're insecure, and you can't help yourself. Can I say that in love? That's okay, too, especially when you realize it. I don't know why I have insecurity. Well, because your dad was really harsh, and all he did was tell you how terrible you were. That's a real good reason to feel insecure. Or you never felt that your voice was important. I'm sorry, I segued. I'll come back to you. (laughs) You never thought your voice was important. I don't expect you to all of a sudden say, my voice is important. No, it's okay for you to say, no one ever valued my voice. I still don't value my voice. That's why I choose abusive relationships. That's why I make the choices I make. What would it be like to have a culture of freedom where people could just suddenly start to realize, hey, I have these weaknesses, and instead of trying to hide them, I can actually run and be healed and show them. Am I talking your language, Anthony? That's a culture. You don't have to have it all together here. We don't need you to look a certain way or sound a certain way. We're not going to respond to your tattoo, your piercing. Even, I want to say this, even your gender struggle, we're not going to overreact. We're going to love you. We're going to accept you. I'm not saying we... We don't accept everything about everybody. I'm not saying about them, but the person themselves. The woman caught in adultery. Jesus didn't cast the stone. I actually thrive being around people that are radical and different from me. I mean, I'm sorry. Sometimes I get really bored around Christians. (sighs) You know, we're born again, not bored again. You know what I'm saying? So Andrea goes, well, so she's testing me like a little bit. Well, I don't really get up in front. I don't, you know. I didn't go, well, what do you do? You know, I mean, you know, it's like, it was more like, that's okay. Yeah. I said, just, um, can you love people? She goes, yeah, I can do that. Good. That's what I need you to do. I need you to love people. So feel free. If they're up front, you know, you see a child that needs to be held or want to go to the back, even help make coffee or tamales, who knows what, you know, just uh, feel free. Just do what you feel led. I don't remember my exact words, but the essence was, it's okay. Well, you could tell the testimony better than I do was how many days was into it was you kind of, well, I find that God was giving you something. You had to say something. How many days was that into it about? The next day, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, oh, okay, I put you on a team that someone else forced you. Okay, I'm glad to hear it wasn't me. <laughs> but anyway, she got up, and she shared, and, and um, but you know, it didn't, it's kind of like, you know, if you overly focus on it, it kind of makes it weird, you know? So I just kind of stayed back, you know, and sure enough, she kept on going up and kept on expanding, and um, and just started flowing. It wasn't you know, she's got such a pure heart, and the moment she just says, God, what's your heart? And she can't help herself. She just finds herself in the, on the raft with Jesus, and, and then now she's just declaring it. And 
it wasn't like an artificial thing. It wasn't like she was creating it. Is this, am I telling a kid, do you want to say anything? Or, no, you got this? Okay. <laughs> but she just really grew in that. And then, literally, on the next Monday, Joe calls me. And he goes, what did you do to my wife? And I go, what do you mean? What did I do? He says, well, I asked her if she wanted to give a testimony about what happened on the mission trip. And she thought a little bit in a while, and she goes, no, I think I'd like just to do the sermon, right? Yeah. <laughs> so she went from zero to 100, okay? <laughs> Never had grabbed the mic, you know. So today, you didn't know it, how excited I was when she did the opening prayer, because I remembered seeing that. But she said something to me afterwards. She may not even know this, but it really impacted me. She said this, I trust you, and when you ask me to do something, I know it's not for you. I know it's because you believe it's best for me. Do you remember saying that? When I talk about this being a culture of freedom, I'm not saying it's not a place where we're not challenged. But we're not challenged you because we're uncomfortable with where you're at or because why aren't you doing more? But it's because we believe in you. See, the number one thing about a culture of freedom is we believe in... See, the number one thing about a culture of freedom is we believe in everybody. There's not important people and unimportant people. There's not gifted people and, and gifted people. There's not some who have the glory and some that are kind of trying to get it. But see, we can't make you believe that you have it. That's our dilemma. Our dilemma is we can teach you the right things. Like, like still, some of you might go, you know, well, I don't know. A better glory than Moses. He was a pretty amazing dude. Yeah, he was. But you have the Holy Spirit inside you and he didn't have that privilege because it was before the work of Christ. We have to see the value in everyone. I'll tell you how I, I learned this the hard way as a pastor. I had two sisters that came to my, uh, my church. By the way, I pastored in, in Hawthorne for five years at a Baptist church. That was my first 10 years. Anybody, was anybody around that ever go there? There was a couple that sometimes would go. Uh, but anyways, I pastored up there by, I lived right by Hawthorne High School. Curtis Conway was playing football. Everybody remembers him. Anyway, uh, but two women came to my church, and one of them, um, she worked for one of the large, uh, you know, companies that are in the area. I can't remember at this time, uh, but a very large company. And uh, she was professional. Man, I'll tell you, she even had her little briefcase, and she just looked styled out, you know. And she had her younger sister with her. Her sister's name was Heather, and Heather was, uh, uh, had pimples on her face and hair stuck to her head. And uh, very, like, it's like she just had crawled out of bed to get dressed for the morning. Very young pastor, my first pastorate. And I'll, I'll, never, I'll never forget just thinking and how in the nat natural, and James talks about this, I mean, I didn't do it on purpose, it just... In the natural, I looked at, you know, the two of them, and I'm thinking to the other, you know, to the one sister that looked, in, you know, amazing. I think her name was Linda. It's like, Linda's really going to contribute a lot. We could really use her work. Newer church, we're growing, we're needing help, and, you know, I want to meet with her. And, and I look, you know, and it's not like I looked at Heather and go, oh, you know, it's like, it was just more like, you know, okay, Heather, let's help Heather, you know. <sighs> I don't know, do her hair. I don't, I don't know at this point, you know. So... <laughs> I'm just being really vulnerable. I mean, I was a 20, like a 20, you know, six-year-old, 27-year-old pastor. Well, three weeks later, Linda was never to be seen again. Heather came to Jesus, got baptized, entered into discipleship, became so, so effective with people pastorally, started discipling people like, like, three months into her Christianity 
was our youth leader within a year. I literally repented to God and said, I want to never do that again. Then when I got into the prophetic, I learned to look at people as they are. I, I had a woman, we just had a mission trip and this one woman came, her name's Michelle. We had a group of about 13. Michelle thought it was a humanitarian trip. Um, she didn't know we were gonna be doing ministry like that. And when I looked at her, she literally was so insecure, she turned her eyes and she couldn't speak to me. And the Lord said, let the team do it. You can't speak to her for a number of days. Why? Because it would be too intimidating. I had a strong group of women. I just went to them and I said, the Lord hasn't released me. Would you just, all I need you to do is love on Michelle and take her with you and tell her um, you just need her intercession. Well, same thing. She comes back. But by the way, I, I, she could barely form sentences, it seemed like. Guess what? The level of abuse that that woman had suffered when she started giving her testimony, she was becoming one of the most effective persons on the team with Kenyan culture because everybody has been traumatized like that. Not just a few, everyone. So she's tearing, people would be sharing these amazing words. Michelle, by the way, I wasn't there because the Lord wouldn't let me have her on, on my team yet because like I said, that would be too imitating. The team would come back and say, when Michelle would tell her story, even weeping, hardly being able to share it, the place would come down. The glory and presence of God would come so fully because there she was, this broken being healed woman was saying, hey, if God can do it for me, he can do it for you. She wasn't putting herself in exalting in another way. By the end of the trip, this woman was like, I mean, I'm serious. She was like this, move over, Benny Hinn. I mean, it was like, I got to prophesy over someone. I mean, I got to wash someone's feet, you know? And they would go into, they went into a village and there was like 400 people there and they washed everybody's feet. And she goes, I don't touch feet normally. <laughs> and then I was released to go see her. And the first thing I said is, Michelle, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. And she looked at me and it was like, you really see me. I had an evangelist on one trip. She was so busy evangelizing, she was too busy to be with the team. They'd get up at six in the morning and all the hotel workers, even the street workers, prostitutes, would stop working and she wanted to go down there and baptize them all. But I felt like the team meeting was important. Not more important, but important for, to get to team build and I wanted her to train and equip. Finally, but I couldn't get her to come to the team meetings at nine. She was trying to get team people to leave during that. That's the time where I prophesy over people. I speak destiny. It's, it's very important to me. It's not a control thing. It's if I can't give you something to go out with or I can't keep the, you know, protect you. And it's just one hour. I just need that time to make sure that you're covered or if someone's sick, you know, having dysentery or something, I need to know. That's our time. And I said, Lord, how do I, what do I do? With a, her name, was, uh, I think, was Edith. And I go, what do, how do I, what do I do? And he said, um, tell her how amazed you are at her evangelistic anointing and you need to have her come to the team meeting and do impartation. <laughs> I didn't confront her. I said, Edith, I can't believe you're out there. You're starting a church. By the way, that church is still going. It's called, uh, yeah, Church on the Street on the Ocean or something. Church on the Beach. It's for street workers and people come to Christ. She came to the team meeting. I said, hey, Edith, it's amazing. Tell, God, tell us what's going on. And she shared and we lined up and she says, I'm giving you the gift of, you know, for evangelism, the heart for the lost and everything. After the meeting, she came to me. She was weeping. She goes, I've never had a leader. They're always offended by me. They're always angry at me. I've never had a leader like value my gift. 
By the way, I, I'm not trying to uplift myself. I'm trying to tell you, tell you what a culture of freedom looks like. Guess what? She didn't miss one team meeting after that, and I never even had to say it. You know, there's a lot of really gifted people in this room. In fact, I think all of you are. In fact, if I had time to meet one-on-one, which I don't, I'd probably believe in more of some of you more than you believe in yourself. In fact, I know I would. You say, I'm shy. I'd say, who told you? I don't know what to say. I'd say, neither do I. (laughs) You don't know the things I've done. I know Jesus does. Do you know him? Yes. Are you forgiven? Yes. Are you living a, a, a lifestyle of repentance? Yes. I've had people come to me, can I go with you? I've been living in sin. I've had an affair coming out of it. Can I, am I qualified? I'd say, are you living in repentance? Yes. I'd say, yes, you are. And even if you weren't, you want to become re- re- repentant right now. <laughs> Some of the most amazing people I've seen do incredible things were the least expected ones. What kind of culture do you have? Culture of freedom. It sees the value of everyone. Number two, in a culture of freedom, people are free to learn who they are and talk who they truly are. We have an identity problem out there. And it's not like someone saying, hey, I don't know if I'm interested in a man or a woman. It's children who are being brought into back rooms, being told, are you confused? And they're being told that maybe you need to change your body and be mutilated and we don't have to tell your parents. Am I being too straight? I literally wish churches would start identity ministries and literally sponsor. We are... For those who are confused or transgender, you're welcome in this place. Because, guess what? We have weapons that are not of this world. The the word says this, we do not, you know, in in, in Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians also it says, we don't look at people with their outer appearance. This is uh, so critical. This is what happened in, uh, you know, 1 Samuel uh, 16 when, when uh, Eliab went in front of Samuel and God said, I do not look to the outer appearance of a man, but I look to his heart. The world has, can't be the, lo- the loudest voice. When I, we need to teach our counselors, we're not shocked by anyone's sin. God's not even shocked at your sin. He's not going, oh, how could they have done that? Because he knows your desperate battles. And he wants to set up a culture of freedom where you don't have to hide anymore. Sometimes we have to do it anonymously. That's, that was the power of like AA. They, they knew that, that sometimes if you were to go to some people. So that's why we tell other churches in the region. We specialize in anyone struggling with transgender. Send them to us. We'll send, you know. And guess what? Your goal isn't always that you're going to be totally the one that changes them. That's God. I don't feel pressure to change anybody. They know it then. They can smell it a hundred miles away. I can ask them questions that are like, tell me where it hurts. Tell me what happened in your life. 
And then what's even better is I get words of knowledge and I tell them what happened in their life. And then they freak out. Then I start telling them who they are. That's why I love prophetic ministry. I love prophetic ministry because I can fall in love with you in 10 seconds by looking through the eyes of God. And guess what? Helps me do that. Freedom. Because I don't need an opinion. My, my freedom of you, my, my opinion of you is irrelevant. Irrelevant. That's how I live life. It took a lot of years of training. I tell myself, you can't have an opinion. I just say, I want to have the mind of Christ. I want to have the eyes of Christ. You say, is that for real? Joe, is that for real? If it's not, correct me. That's a culture of freedom. Third thing about a culture of freedom, everybody belongs. Some people feel like they've never belonged. There's no inside circle here. There really isn't. Everybody in our church you go, well, how do you get in the inner circle? Well, we have a staff, we have a board, and that's because the board, the elders, they're, they're our overseers and they protect the integrity of the house. Our staff members are assigned lanes, and then they also do things together, but their main role is to equip you. There's no inner circle other than that. Not everybody can be best friends at Joe and Andrea's dinner table. Okay? They're so busy, they just barely want to squeak out their own date night. The inner circle is this. It's a family. Everybody belongs. And if the enemy tells you you don't belong, I'm not saying there aren't other places you should go, but it's not because you don't belong. It's because you have different interests or a different call or a different need. That's all good. I'm totally comfortable with that. But I'm not comfortable saying that we don't create a culture where everybody belongs. Because in a culture where it belongs, hey, you don't speak English? That's all good. You say, oh, I speak Spanish. Well, your Spanish is better than mine. <laughs> Gloria a Dios. <laughs> I, have a, I have a pastor friend who he spoke no English, and the Lord told him to speak a, an English-speaking service. Could you imagine? He'd have to go to the computer and use Google Translate to preach a sermon. And people would just come to his church going, I don't know what happened, but the Spirit told me to come here. And he had to get out to Google Translate to say, it's really good to have you. <laughs> Within a year, his English congregation was twice the size of his Korean one. And if God wants to grow your church, what makes you think it's going to be in English? What is wrong? If you got Hispanics, Hispanics, Russians, Russian, you know, the language, find out, do a demographic study. Who's your language? Start language groups. Invite them over for dinner. It'll be great. You can look at each other, take out your phones, and use Google Translate. I love international people. They want to know if you accept them, especially if you're a white male in your 50s or 60s. I'm serious. I've been in stores where I gave a coupon to a woman that didn't speak English, and she looked at me and wept. Like, why did you even recognize me? I'm nothing. You're the freedom culture. And your children, what happens if they're totally different from you, diametrically opposed to everything you think you stand for? I have one. He told me, after nine months of relentless pursuit, you're the most open-minded person I've ever met in my life. You really accept people who are different. And I said, it's easy because I love you and I'd rather have a relationship with you. You know what I stand for. And he said that, yeah. If there's a real Christian, you and mom are it. 
problem is I can't find any other ones, hardly. And that leads me to the fourth one. Coast Christian and you are to become conflict management experts. I believe that churches now should have, I'm, well, that's a word, remember, freedom word. That's not a good freedom word. I encourage churches <laughs> to have, I don't know what you call it, reconciliation team, minist- you know, reconciliation ministry. I believe that churches should have teams where people can bring families, not long-term marriage counseling, I'm not saying that, because we can refer those, but help people resolve conflicts If people won't come with them, they can learn in classes how they can change. Did you know that you can reach anybody's heart? But it won't come from you telling them how bad they are or how different they are. A culture that knows how to handle differences. You know, some churches, people have conflict in a church. They have a desire to serve. This is what happens in most churches. People have a desire to serve. They get to know people well enough. They get trained. They get involved. They start to have conflict, and all their old patterns of relating come up. They have a a division, a strife, and then they leave and go somewhere else. Is this true? What happens if Coast Christian was the place where you learned that it's okay to have differences and we actually have a team that will help you resolve it? We have classes that will help you work through differences. We will have classes that will teach you what healthy conflict looks like. And then we'll practice and it will be so fun. Fundamental. <laughs> Could you imagine a class, conflict class? Come to our conflict, conflict cl- class and have fun. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be a church like that. Lastly, in a culture of freedom, We all worship, minister differently. My wife, okay, I I do live, if you know my wife, Ann, anybody here know my wife, Ann? Oh, wow, a lot of hands went up. Who you see up front is who she is at home. There's no disparity, okay? This woman is in the Word and in prayer She doesn't like it when I do this. She's here because I'm not trying to lift her up. She's an example. I learned from her. Average of three, four hours a day. I know it's a luxury, but she, she does it. And she leads prayer groups in the city. She was the one that went downtown Portland when Antifa was at its worst. And, and she loved on Antifa with muffins. <laughs> Antifa liked her. Well, until one day when... Uh, The angry fist came out, but God sent a, sent a woman to settle the guy down. But anyways, what I was going to say is, if I compared her, myself to her, I used to feel like, God, I'm so different. She likes all-night prayer meetings. I like to the point an hour one, okay? Focused with my sword, let's go. I go to a prayer meeting with her. I want to prophesy over everybody in the room. Okay? That's just, I can't help myself. She wants to worship for three hours. Finally, she said, you know what's a great idea? Don't come to my prayer meeting. (laughs) Do you know how freeing that was? She said, we're going to be doing prophetic ministry from like two to three. Why don't you come then? You can even lead it. Okay, good. That doesn't mean, by the way, I worship, okay? I just worship differently. 
I start, you know, getting revelation. John 5, 19 is my favorite verse. The son can do nothing by himself. He only does what he sees the father doing. When I'm sitting there in worship, the only, that's my main question. Father, what are you doing? That's all I ask. The Lord told me what he was doing at Coast Christian. He said, I want to raise up the prophetic level. I want to create prophetic teams with precision for this region. That's what I heard the word for Coast Christian. Not one team because you have one team, you know, they all want, someone wants to play for Israel and another one wants to play for laws, you know, for, 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 you know, people in law enforcement. Well, go into two teams and one prays for law enforcement and one prays for Israel. I mean, let people focus. Raise up some prophetic prayer ninjas who know how to raise up other prophetic prayer ninjas or special forces, whatever phrase you want to use. But anyways, that's a word that I have for this church. If you're prophetic, it's time to go to another level and to specialize and to focus. But what I want to say here is that your differences, you, if you can come to the point where your differences are your strength, and you don't have to be like the next person, but you can be yourself. You don't have to prophesy the same. My wife sees pictures. I mean, my wife has such vivid visions, and I don't. I have stick men and green little images. But I tell you, I hear specific words. I hear names, ages, specific times in people's lives. My wife goes, I wish I could be like that. And I look at her and I say, I wish I could be like you and have encounters and see Jesus' face, the detail you do. And then you know what we say? We join hands and say, aren't we a good team? My di- our differences are our strength. You know when the band starts creeping behind you, you're really supposed to finish that last point. <laughs> So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with a prayer, okay? But I want to I say this, and I want to say it as genuinely as I can from the heart of the Father. I believe in you. I do not doubt you in any way. I think you are amazing, and I think what you carry others deserve to receive what you have Father I just pray right now as an apostle by the way that title doesn't mean to me uh, you call me Mark, call me dude, call me friend brother okay I don't, I'm not, I don't go by the title as much as I go by the function but I have the function to release a level of the freedom in your life and in this house and I command a blessing I command a blessing of freedom upon your heart, upon your mind, upon your family, upon your business, upon your finances. I command a a freedom into your ministry. I command a blessing, a freedom on my spiritual son and daughter who, who honor me with that. And I declare my love for them. I speak freedom into you. Andrea, I see that new level of boldness coming. It's a holy boldness that's filled with, with, with words of honey and life. And Joe, I see words of really of identity, strong identity, tearing off strongholds of people's false identities. And I speak that over Coast Christian. I declare house of freedom, house of freedom, as you contemplate his glory together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.